here. Also, thank you for the invitation. Um, yeah, basically, um, everyone knows what Zalando does, I assume. Is there someone who never heard the name or don't know what they are doing? That would be fine. Uh, everyone knows? Good. <laughs> so I don't need to explain the basics. So we're working in the fashion industry. Um, what I'm doing at the moment is building an app, heading more uh, to a younger target group mainly so-called Gen Z and millennials, so the really young ones. And we are building Android and iOS app that offers shoppable social content. So we're working with uh, influencers, with fetching brand content, also working with YouTubers and making their content shoppable. So you have the Instagram feed you know from brands. In our app you'll see the Instagram feed and you can buy the stuff you're seeing there directly. So you don't need to search for it, whatever, it's directly linked there. You also have then, of course, the common social functions like following stuff. You can like the style, so influencers also get the feedback. Um, that's basically what I'm doing for since two years. So, and what I would like to talk, yeah, 99 problems, but users understand one. So, uh, what I like to share is the experience uh, we did during the uh, last years uh, when it comes to understanding users, uh, doing design thinking what really helped us to understand the problem better or to validate some really quickly stuff so that you don't need to build something and then in the end you're being very, very annoyed that it didn't work out. Um, is anyone or everyone common with the idea of design thinking in general? Yeah, okay, so I, I assume for you guys, of course. <laughs> But uh, okay, then I can quickly jump over this uh, thing because then you already know the idea of the human-centered approach and also that asking users for what they want and asking for requirement didn't really work out to learn what really is their problem because they are telling you some ideas, solutions, features, whatever and you don't know if it really fits to their need and really solve their problem. So we all agree, okay, it's much more better to learn about your problem and then thinking how you can solve this problem for them to build some awesome products. So, uh, for instance, as an example, we had uh, research about uh, fashion behavior of people. You want to learn what are people doing when they're buying fashion. And uh, we also checked it for offline stuff. So uh, we really learned what's the difference maybe between online and offline. What is the normal behavior? How could we solve it online? Is there a gap? Don't we need to do anything? And what we really heard a lot of, from out of 30 people we asked, but 20 said they don't go shopping alone. So they're always going shopping with friends, with the family, with someone they know. Uh, what we also heard for some is five reading vlogs before they're going shopping for fashion, but they like to be shopping alone. So it seems to be different than the other one. And um, three, they, they don't need anything. They just go shopping and they know so much and so well what they want to buy. They don't need to ask anyone. So uh, we said, okay, we heard it a lot. It seems like there is some lack of social experience in shopping, right? If 20 people say, okay, I shop offline with friends, online, I'm sitting alone on the computer. But of course, that would be way too easy, right? So we zoomed out again, we mixed it all together in different, uh, ang uh, in different uh, combinations and looked at different angles. And then we came to a point where we said, okay, the most common problem seems that all of them look for confirmation. So if we don't dive deeper, okay, 20 don't trust the shopping system, so they take friends with them or the family, that they, someone they trust with the feedback. Five, don't trust the, fish, uh, the fashion opinion of their surroundings because they say, hey, I'm so way ahead of all my friends, so I don't ask them because they like it a half a year later. And three were fashion professionals, and of course they are ahead of blogs, but they have their own conferences, networks, whatever, so they know their trends even before the blogs, but they have their confirmation also on their level. So uh, that's exactly what then uh, the point where we say, okay, uh, it seems to be the real problem that you can, uh, that they're looking for confirmation that someone you can design on also for online. Because a social experience for online would be really hard to really do, right? So designing on this problem seems to be way better. And actually now I will share some examples or tools that I had learned over the years that really helped us in the research, but also when we start to building stuff. Uh, and I will just share some examples of what we did. And one thing I learned that what really helped so it was analogous research, um, which I didn't know uh, before I worked with audio actually exactly. And it means that you're starting research in similar areas because you might have a similar problem. 
and maybe users have a workaround there where you can learn, or they already have a solution for that. So it makes sense to go to look left or right from you to see if there's some stuff in the world already that seems similar to yours for the problem. So, um, for instance, we went for this research for the users also to Paris, and there was a really amazing uh, perfume shop there. They have about 400, 500 different uh, scents. So yeah, overwhelming, you wouldn't know what you do, and if you have the normal stuff going there, trying everything out, you would not smell anything in five minutes anymore. So they have a system developed that they're giving you a really small set of basic scents, five different ones, and you decide what you like most. And then they're going deep with five other ones, and then five again, until you come to the scent that you really like. So that was, you have all the time there, you have an iPad, and a really amazing experience, and you learned, okay, if you have a really overwhelming assortment, you can create small portions and go step by step to the step you really want. And in the same research, we also were in Paris in an oil and vinegar shop. And they, for instance, had an amazing story to every oil and vinegar they are selling. So who was growing it, how old it was, what region it coming from, is it some really rare stuff or not. So they're really revealing the value of all the stuff. So if you're buying it, you really have the feeling, okay, I'm buying the right product and it's really special and it's worth the money. So um, that was two examples there, and the, the third one is a different one, where we use, use analogous research uh, in a very different uh, uh, way, and we did uh, research about mobile uh, experience. So I worked on a search product in the fashion store before, and I know a lot about search, but we said at a certain point, okay, we are now app only, so maybe this is totally different area, totally different problems users have on a small screen than they have on their uh, laptops. So uh, we said, okay, let's do that and so do a special research only for mobile behavior. So um, what we did in the beginning was we collect all the motivations, why you go out for a hunt, hunting a product, to searching something. And out of that, then we wrote jobs to be done. Um, yeah, there written in a special syntax. Um, it's always kind of when I want to so I can. So as an example, so when I see a nice pen born on the streets, I want to find out where to get the pens like this. So I can be just as cool as they do on the streets. So that's the motivation why I want to do this. Uh, and we translated all those motivations to jobs. And then we said, okay, for mobile research, there might be also apps out there that have a super nice experience, but maybe not in fashion. So we decided we do analogous research and trying out a lot of apps and evaluating them. So what we did then is we translating all the jobs we had to other areas so that you have the same kind of job for different areas. So like music, when I heard the cool music at yesterday's house party, I wanted to find out where to get more like this so I can enjoy and have fun listening during this, during my work. So we have the same kind of job, analogous to the different areas. Uh, what we then did, testing a lot of apps with those jobs and seeing how the experience was to, of course, for us, evaluate what is out there, what maybe is cool, what is not cool, and identify at least three apps that are worth doing with user tests because we cannot let users test 50 apps. <laughs> so we took the three ones that we said, okay, that are the most promising ones, that we think are pretty cool, and now let's just look what users did and what they say. So we let them do all the jobs on those apps, and then also just let them do the talking. We can just learn from what they say, if they have the same idea as us, if they have different problems or different feedback, so you have an evaluation there too. So, and um, biggest surprise in the research is that when everyone really asked on this one app for the one job if they can just quit the app. And then say, yeah, okay, then fine, then quit the app, go ahead, then show us just what you want to, or how you would solve the problem in general. So we have the work out from the uh, work around from them to learn from them what they normally would do to solve that problem. So that app somehow didn't work out for this, it was really funny because it was the same app for everyone. So we said, okay, for this job, this app totally fails. <laughs> So, um, well, really interesting, but you can learn a lot of them too. So, some insights we really did there, or got there from the analogous part of, of the different areas that we have. It really depends on the jobs you have, if the search experience is really good on mobile. So it's not, you have this one app that has a really cool search, it really depending on the jobs and how they solve them. Pinterest for it, it's uh, good for inspiration, right? 
you have a lot of inspirational content, you can browse through that and you have a search for other inspirational parts. If it really coming to a really specific stuff, like I have the sneakers and I really want to have this cool look, how the sneakers look cool on the streets, it's hard with Pinterest to solve that. People then also say, I'm going to Google picture search and looking for this shoe and then I look for the pictures there. So, um, but for the inspirational part, Pinterest is awesome. So, and then, even if you're a mobile, uh, you have a limited space and you think, okay, text is the quickest way to your search results, so everyone will maybe start to input text. It also depends on what area or what job you have there. So, we had a girl that really intensively used the text search and or, or still she at a certain point of deepness in your search, you say, okay, I'm now quitting and don't define the query anymore and now using filters and going visual to see what I'm, because I'm afraid I'm missing out now if I change the query again, because I have the feeling I'm quite near, not there, but I want to have the visual feedback again. So that was also interesting. And also all the, the users were looking for feedback and confirmation. So if they have an action and executing something for search, they want to see some feedback, changing of result, a new filter, whatever, and if it doesn't happen on the screen, they were really looking. Where is the difference from the screen before? So they were searching for something that gives them the feedback, something changed because of your action. So, um, yeah, that was really interesting. Then, next thing, um, going post-user research. So you have, or you think you have understood the problem, you have an idea how you solve that. Uh, one thing that everyone knows, and from my experience not everyone does, is guerrilla testing. So you're really going quickly out in the streets and asking people. So you're thinking where is your target group, going there <coughs> meeting this target group and try to get into some um, interviews with them and they talk, talking with them about the problem solution or testing the prototype. And it's really quite cheap. So it doesn't cost a lot of money because it costs your working time and depending on the quality of the prototype, some work for the prototype level, right? Um, it's fast, you can do it every day, every week, whenever you want to. And it's really quick to iterate, to change something and going back out again and get some new feedback. So like there you can apply it really on any stage of the idea. You can have paper prototypes, wireframes, totally full designs. You can do it all the time. It's really, really good um, just to get some quick feedback, right? It's not a quantitative research, but we have some quick research, uh, uh, feedback. Does the idea work in general? Does users understand the interface, anything? So you can go on with that. Um, best experience there is also design and test in teams. So don't do it on your own. Always try to invite others that they participate because they have different opinions, different point of view, different um, experiences. Also, maybe depending on the domain knowledge, they have totally different uh, uh, expertise on anything. So, and it really helps in preparation, also in the testing, and also in follow-up discussions. When you discuss, okay, what did you get as feedback? What did you learn? What is the inside out of that? So, collaboration there really uh, adds value. And there we do it for the, with the Finnish team because our development is in Finland, and we also did it there. And for guerrilla testing. It's stereotype, but somehow it's true. And even the Finnish colleagues said, oh, I'm not sure. So biggest fear was, could we find Finnish people out in the streets that would talk to us? Because they are not so talkative to strangers, <laughs> right? Just going and street pointing out of them. Um, and even the Finnish engineer said, oh, I'm not so sure that this will work out. Uh, we can try. And fun fact works, yeah, it works out as in Berlin. So it, <laughs> we had 10 people in two hours where we really talked about our ideas and we get quickly feedback about this. So somehow also prove if you step uh, into this area and go, uh, then it works out. You find people that will talk to you that have time. Maybe you need to work on the contact question that you don't make them afraid of whatever, but uh, at the end it really works out and you get people uh, that talk to you. you. And if you listen to them, they really want also to tell you something. So it's really easy. If you get them to talk, if you listen to them, they are really willing to share stuff with you. So uh, for guerrilla testing, from my experience, what really helps is testing teams. One is speaking, so you have a constant, normal talk with someone, and the other one takes notes, so that the normal talk is not interrupted by someone taking notes and saying, ah, I'll ask you later. So two people really works out better. 
and they also don't intimidate as much as a single person when you approach to someone. So we have a really young target group, so somehow we went also to Primark. And then there's this awkward situation when you went there alone and you trying to talk to a 15 year old girl and then their parents came and hey what is this old man doing with my young daughter so it's always better to go there with two people it worked really really better then <laughs> no. and what is also uh, uh, quite good is that you prepare questions that get people somehow already in the mindset of what you want to test that they feel the situation that uh, you say okay if you're now on this app you want to do this and that or you, this is your problem and then you have uh, this app in your hand what would you do so they can think in this situation and not wondering what they see so it feels more natural for them to just use your app and do something with it um, always ask for expectations before actions so when before they tap on anything just ask them okay what do you think would happen what would you expect happening there if you tap there or if you scroll or whatever and after the action just ask them if there's a difference to the expectation and what exactly the difference is. Then also you will hear uh, if the difference is bad or good, because sometimes the surprising thing is always that it's better than expected. But it's also good to learn, learn the difference from their perspective. And what also really, really helped is do a dry run with some of your random colleagues in the company before you go out, because you will feel safer you will just learn if all the questions were understood, or at least have the first indicator were understood as you think they should be. So it's good to test it just internally. Um, other stuff also, I think most heard is for small experiments, you can do them online, in the app, or on site. Um, and therefore, it's good to just split up all the big problems and assumptions you have into really single small questions and assumptions so that you can test them really easy, quickly, and independently from each other. So you don't need to have a really complex thing with lots of assumptions, complexities, and so it's always one question, one answer. It's more easier to learn. So uh, if you have the questions or assumptions, you need to think, OK, what's the most important question that we need to answer to go on? So if you don't find an answer to this question, it doesn't make sense to go on because it wouldn't work out. So uh, the biggest stopper needs to be answered first. So um, what we use there also is a drawing experiment out like storyboards, because then you think like a film sequence, you're thinking how the experiment, and you also see, okay, there might be a problem there. We need to design it maybe differently, or there could be an open question. And it's, if you write storyboards, it's easy for experiments to better understand them beforehand. And we have this sheet where you then describe, okay, we believe that assumption um, to verify that that is uh, what we want to do there. And um, the measure, of course, when you say, OK, how do we learn with this experiment if it went out well, good, or even it's indifferent? You need to do something differently to, to learn about this question. And the action. That's also learning uh, always define before the experiment or before the test what would be the consequence out of the test. Because then you're not cheating. <laughs> because that's also, if you're just having a test, then somehow there's a certain point when you love a feature, whatever, you're trying to interpret it differently so that it might be fit still. So defining the action before that is better for you because you're not lying to yourself then afterwards. Um, Can I ask, you know, what do you mean with defining the action? You mean like defining KPIs for your MVP? Or that's that's um, the measure, but let's say... Or like concrete action. Yeah, yeah concrete, let's say you have, the, uh, have an assumption that everyone likes pets, right? So you're going out trying to learn about that. So what is, if not everyone likes pets, what's the action on that? The do we do another follow-up experiment? Do you stop that because you have the totally wrong assumption and need to go back to think about something totally differently? You should think what is the consequence okay. of the outcome of your test mm -hmm. before you start the test. But we're like having an okay. <laughs> Sorry, yes. In the case that your assumption is not correct. Exactly. Or it's the risk really assumption. It's indifferent. One we have to right? validate for or invalidate first. Invalidate yeah. the risk assumption. But so would you have a KPI of let's say uh, out of eight of ten people have to love pets, or what would be the KPI? Because I mean, if you depending randomly on have one person who doesn't like pets, it's yeah, probably not enough to go back and stop everything. 
but depending on your experiment, right? You can do qualitative experiments, you can do quantitative experiments with 100,000 users. So depending on what you're designing as an experiment, you need to define in KPI and that makes sense for you and also give you really some proof that this is a good idea because at the end you're spending a lot of working time there, money, everything, so you don't want to fail. Mm. So uh, yeah, KPI is the right point. Uh, that's what uh, I, as is the description of how you measure it. It should be well discussed and thought through what is the real good measurement to say this experiment is valid and the result is valid and it points to any direction that you can work with this, which means positive or negative. And also an action could be if it's indifferent, you need another experiment because then you need to look at it differently because the experiment maybe didn't work out for this. So one of the stuff that uh, also popular idea and also work out quite well in the early stage is fake doors. So um, you're just really pretending that you're offering a service and you're also offering the right button or whatever so the people, users can act on this. Right, you not asking them, would you like this service? Would you like this idea? So give me your email because then you would learn that people maybe would like to give you the email for this topic. So, but you don't know if they would use your stuff then. So, faking a button and maybe putting a survey behind that or just a message that say, hey, feature is not there, we're working on it, but it's really cool that you are already interested. So, just hold on for four weeks and then it's out, something like this. Um, it really uh, gives you some good indicators that people at least understanding the button and have a need to use that or try it out. Um, same uh, with basic features. So uh, you can really beat this super stripped down basic feature and add a questionnaire. So we also we have a really young target group. Of course, we only not only have pictures, they look a lot of videos, so we also did just a video there, it was not shoppable anything, it was just video, play and then a short questionnaire. So hey, do you like what you see? Do you want to see more of that? So you get also an indicator if people are interested after they also seen the video, right? Because maybe they are tapping it because they see video, but the content they see, oh, it's maybe boring. Then they can also decide, no, thank you. So only tapping on the video play button is not the indicator if the content maybe is interesting for them. So that could also be a way to uh, validate more on this question. 